Well, good morning and welcome. Today we're going to be describing uh, the basis for the laboratory of Module 9 for Course 537. Uh, this is focused on a cleavage reaction of the N2 molecule by a coordination complex of molybdenum. This uh, introduction is presented uh, by myself. I am Christopher Cummins, professor of chemistry here at MIT. Um, if you wish, you can use my nickname, which is Kit, K-I-T. And also, if you have more questions about this experiment or the background leading up to it, uh, please feel free to give me um, an email at ccummins at mit.edu. I hope you enjoy this experiment and what you're going to learn in the course of it. First of all, we're going to be focusing on one of the early transition metals. This is molybdenum, element number 42. Early transition metals in this part of the periodic table are often used to effect transformations of substances, small molecules included, uh, from the upper right-hand part of the periodic table where we have our familiar carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen elements. And today we're going to focus on nitrogen. Some of the other research in my laboratory focuses on niobium chemistry and phosphorus chemistry, which is why uh, those elements were highlighted in this particular periodic table. The molecule at the center of the story is this three-coordinate molybdenum complex, which was in fact discovered by an undergraduate at MIT, Catalina La Plaza, working in my laboratory. And uh, there are a number of factors that led us to discover this amazing molecule and related derivatives. But let me just first point out that typical coordination numbers for molybdenum are four, five, and six, and even complexes with seven nearest neighbor atoms close to the molybdenum are known. And this one has only three nearest neighbors, the nitrogen here, here, and over here. And uh, when a, a transition metal has only three nearest neighbor atoms, we refer to that transition metal as uh, being three coordinate, that is, the complex uh, is in coordination number three around that central transition metal. This is only usually possible, such low coordination numbers, when using very sterically demanding ligands. And so uh, a ligand is just any molecule or ion that is directly connected to that central metal. And so our, our ligand here, we have uh, three of them. is something called an amide ligand, and so I'll, I'll just draw a circle around one of them. And there's another one in the back over here. And, and there's one here in the front. And these three ligands are identical. They're essentially derived from a simple amine that I'm sketching out down here at the lower right. This is N-tert-butyl 3,5-dimethyl aniline. And so what happens uh, in the course of the experiment is you're going to synthesize this amine, and you're also going to deprotonate it with N-butyllithium, that is to subtract that hydrogen here, that proton, and so each each of these ligands in the complex is said to have a um, is said to have a formal charge of one minus, and so uh, with three of these present, the molybdenum center formally has a three plus overall charge, and that means furthermore if it's molybdenum in the plus three oxidation state, that we have a D3 center because molybdenum is in group six of the periodic table. Uh, the meaning of that, in turn, 
is that the molybdenum center has uh, three D electrons that are non-bonding uh, si uh, situated in molybdenum-based D orbitals. And it's the presence of these three D electrons on the metal center uh, that leads to the spectacular reactivity of this system, not only with elemental nitrogen, but with a variety of other elements and small molecules and also organic functional groups. So having mentioned that we've got three non-bonding D electrons in this system, let me just point out that uh, these are in orbitals that uh, from an electronic structure calculation on a model system where we have just a methyl group and a phenyl group on the amide nitrogens as the substituents, uh, we see here uh, that if our z-axis is pointing up this way, that the, the orbital here containing one of the non-bonding d electrons is the dz squared orbital. And then we have one electron in dxz and one electron in dyz. Of course, you could draw a crystal field splitting diagram for this system. That would show like this. We'd have a vertical axis for the energy. And we would have um, one, two, uh, three low-lying d orbitals and two high-lying d orbitals. And in particular, these three low-lying orbitals are the dz squared, the dxz, and the dyz. And these are occupied each with one electron. And the high-lying two d orbitals are not pictured in the diagram, uh, not, not shown in terms of orbital representations, but these would be the ones that lie in the same plane as the amide nitrogens, namely the dxy and the dx squared minus y squared. And therefore, uh, these have sigma star character with respect to the amide molybdenum bonds. And so they're empty in this, in this system. Uh, the 3D electrons that are present in these non-bonding orbitals uh, have respectively uh, sigma and, and pi symmetry with respect to the z-axis. And what that means is that with these electrons participating, the metal center can increase its coordination number from 3 to 4 while forming a sigma bond using the z squared electron and forming two pi bonds using the dxz and dyz electrons. And that, that makes our system isolable to a nitrogen atom. We're talking here about a ni nitrogen atom. Uh, if you have just a nitrogen atom floating around in the gas phase dissoci in disso fully dissociated form, not bonded to anything, then it has its five valence electrons organized as follows. It has a lone pair in the nitrogen 2s orbital. And then in each of the p orbitals, there's one electron in the, gro in the ground state of the gaseous free nitrogen atom. Those three electrons, um, like the 3d electrons in this three coordinate molybdenum 3 complex, have uh, the ability to form a sigma bond using the pz electron and pi bonds using the px and the py electrons. And so that's why we say that a three coordinate molybdenum three complex is isolable to a nitrogen atom. Of course, if two nitrogen atoms come together, then they will form a sigma and two pi bonds producing the N2 molecule that is very stable and that's one of the main players in our laboratory today. And uh, similarly, you might ask, uh, why is it that this molybdenum complex can be isolated if it has an electronic structure that is analogous to that of a nitrogen atom? And the reason is because of the substituents that we've chosen to put on the, nitrogen, uh, on the nitrogens of the amide ligands. They're very sterically demanding with a substituted aromatic ring as one of the substituents and a t-butyl group as one of the other substituents. And 
that prevents the close approach of two of the molybdenum complexes that would otherwise result in a known class of compounds that have metal-metal triple bonds. And so uh, here's, once again, this line drawing of the three-coordinate molybdenum-3 complex, and you can see the bulky tertiary butyl groups and the bulky substituted aromatic rings that prevent two molybdenum atoms from coming close enough together to form a metal-metal triple bond, but still permitting access to the molybdenum center of, by a small molecule such as the N2 molecule as shown here. And so after you learn how to synthesize the three-coordinate molybdenum complex, you'll find that placing it under a nitrogen atmosphere and cooling the solution uh, leads to the formation of an observable intermediate. Actually, this intermediate is more than observable. We can actually isolate it and get characterization data on it. And one of the things I'll do in the remaining slides is to show you some of the ways that we've been able to characterize this intermediate complex and also uh, the final complexes in this system in which the N2 molecule has been completely severed because two of these molybdenum complexes come together forming a, a dinuclear species with an N2 bridge. We've gotten a lot of characterization data on this and war allowing the system to warm to room temperature, uh, we, we think via a zigzag transition state as shown here, in which you're getting a bending at the MONN linkage that is starting to allow lone pairs to develop on these nitrogen atoms, as I'm drawing in here, uh, then finally leads to homolysis of the MNN bond, thermal homolysis of the NN bond with formation of two new triple bonds and uh, these terminal nitrido complexes, as they're called, have um, one sigma and two pi bonds formed between the molybdenum and the terminal nitrido nitrogen atoms. We've been able to experimentally assess the metal nitrogen triple bond energy and it has, its thermochemistry has revealed an energy, a bond association energy for that linkage of about 155 kilocalories per mole. And we formed two of those very strong metal nitrogen triple bonds in the course of cleaving the very strong bond of one N2 molecule, which is worth about 226 kcals per mole. So in the process of binding the N2 molecule, and completely splitting it apart, we have a system that models the rate determining step in the Haber-Bosch ammonia synthesis reaction, which is dissociative adsorption of N2 on a catalyst particle surface. So that Haber-Bosch ammonia synthesis reaction uh, is the basis for industrial ammonia synthesis worldwide, and it, it, it is the starting point of for the synthetic production of nitrogen containing fertilizers and other chemicals, a hugely important process and that this molecule modeled in solution for the very first time and therefore we were very interested to study this reaction and learn about the electronic structure and the properties of the complexes that were capable of such an amazing reaction. It was actually seen for the first time in around 1965 that N2 could serve as a ligand in a coordination complex. Prior to that time, that had never been seen, and the, N, the N2 molecule had been assumed to be essentially inert with respect to coordination complexes. But uh, then, uh, when it was discovered that this complex not only binds the N2 molecule, but is able to completely split it apart, that opened the possibility for using um, an N2 splitting reaction involving homogeneous complexes as the basis uh, for fixing nitrogen using synthetic coordination complexes and to do so in a way that involves a nitrogen cleavage reaction as the important first step in that process. And so um, I will also mention that uh, a property of the starting material is that it ha it's open shell, it has three unpaired electrons uh, the, the purple bridging dinitrogen complex intermediate has two unpaired electrons. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And then in the end, 
all the electrons in the system are paired up and we have a diamagnetic system. So this is, uh, we, overall, a six electron process that utilizes the three D electrons uh, times two of the three coordinate molybdenum complex to effect the re complete reductive cleavage of the N2 molecule so that the nitrido ligand is formally three minus in the product complex. The, oxida the formal oxidation state of molybdenum goes from plus three to plus four to plus five to plus six in the process of splitting the N2 molecule. So let's look at some of the properties of these complexes that you'll be working with. This is the crystal structure obtained by a single crystal X-ray crystallography uh, of the bridging N2 complex intermediate. So we, we found one important uh, structural parameter here that the NN distance is only about a tenth of an angstrom longer than it is in the free dinitrogen molecule. Here it is about 1.2 angstroms. That's the NN distance between the two nitrogen atoms from the N2 molecule that is serving as a bridging ligand in this dinuclear dimolybdenum complex. And you see two views of, of it in this um, end-on view and also in the side-on view to some extent. You can appreciate that the MONNMO tetraatomic core in this system is essentially linear and that there is also um, essentially a three-fold axis of rotation. So you have a, a C3 axis in this system and that leads to orbital degeneracies. And that in turn is going to help explain why this system actually has two unpaired electrons. Oh, uh, one more thing to mention in the structure of the bridging N2 complex intermediate is that you can see that um, the, the, N, the small N2 molecule is capable of bridging between the two molybdenum centers and the six T-butyl groups in the system are brought very close together and there's steric clashing here and actually if we use substituents that are larger than tertiary butyl to, that would come into this space we can actually completely shut down the formation of any bridging N2 complexes. So the T-butyl group selection here is really important because it's big enough to keep the two molybdenums from coming together and forming a molybdenum molybdenum triple bond but it's also small enough to permit the formation of an N2 bridge between the two molybdenum centers. So that structural attribute uh, is nicely illustrated in this crystal structure. This uh, crystal was grown at low temperature after formation of the purple solution of the bridging N2 complex intermediate um, and it was able to be mounted on the X-ray diffractometer at low temperature for determination of the crystal structure. This was a, a really nice achievement done by graduate student John Curley. And that same graduate student was able to characterize this bridging N2 complex in three states of charge. He was able to isolate it as the neutral species that we were just looking at that you'll be working with the neutral species, as we mentioned, has uh, an NN bond distance of just a little longer than 1.2 angstroms, a tenth of an angstrom longer than in free dinitrogen. And what we see here is a correlation between the NN distance in the neutral species, the purple neutral species, and in the monocation where one of the unpaired electrons has been removed by a chemical oxidant and in the dication where both of the unpaired electrons have been removed by a chemical oxidant. And so on the right hand side here we see an energy level diagram that's populated initially with four of the electrons in the pi system that are all paired up in the dication. In the purple neutral species this degenerate orbital has two electrons in it. It's it is actually an orbital in the pi system that spans the tetraatomic MONNMO core in the system and it has NN bonding character so the effect of oxidizing first by one electron to make the monocation and then by another electron to make the dication 
is actually to increase the NN bond length. Those have also been characterized by X-ray diffraction studies, so we know the NN bond length, and it gets longer as you take out first one and then a second of these unpaired electrons. And furthermore, that lengthening of the NN bond corresponds with a decrease in the energy of the NN stretching frequency as measured by Raman spectroscopy. And there's an essentially perfect correlation of the energy of the stretching frequency with the NN bond distance in these three complexes, the neutral, the one plus, and the two plus, and also extending to the N2 molecule itself. And so the NN stretching frequency is close to 2300 reciprocal centimeters here in the neutral species, and then uh, binding it to molybdenum um, decreases to about 1640 reciprocal centimeters, and then oxidizing and lengthening the bond uh, decreases the stretching frequency ultimately in the dication down here to less than 1400 reciprocal centimeters. And what you're seeing on the bottom is one of these uh, Raman spectra uh, where we were getting the data for the NN stretching frequency, and you can see that when we're using natural isotopic abundance nitrogen, we get the peak right here, and if we use N15 labeled dinitrogen, that peak shifts further to lower energy due to the heavy uh, isotopomer, the N15 isotope uh, present in the NN oscillator. And so we can conclusively assign this peak as due to the NN stretching frequency because when we synthesize the complex using N15 labeled N2, uh, that band shifts in, in the uh, expected direction and by the expected amount. Those two unpaired electrons in the purple bridging N2 complex intermediate give rise to interesting magnetic properties that we've been able to study as a function both of temperature and as also as a function of the magnetic field, allowing us to assign an S equals one ground state to that bridging N2 complex intermediate. So that's S equals one, that's a triplet state with those two unpaired electrons. I won't say too much more about that. Another way that we've been able to characterize these complexes has been th through NMR spectroscopy. When we get to the final molybdenum nitride complex, the crystal structure of which is shown here, uh, we have a very short molybdenum nitrogen triple bond. This is about 1.66 angstroms in length. And furthermore, we could derive this species from N15 labeled dinitrogen, and so we can do N15 NMR spectroscopy on this system. And when we synthesize this with N15 labeling in the nitride position at the molybdenum nitrogen triple bond, we're able to get electronic structure information and characterize the nature of the molybdenum nitrogen triple bond by uh, doing solid state NMR spectroscopy, N15 NMR spectroscopy, in conjunction with quantum chemical calculations that have allowed us uh, to simulate the experimentally de derived spectrum. So the green spectrum, uh, which is offset, is, is from quantum chemical calculations. The predictions not only of the isotropic chemical shift, that is the average shielding for the nitrogen if it were tumbling, um, uh, designated here by the asterisk about the chemical shift comes at, a, uh, at greater than 800 parts per million. Here's the isotropic chemical shift. Uh, but there's also a lot of information contained in the pattern of intensities of the spinning sidebands in the solid state cross polarization magic angle spinning solid state NMR spectrum of this system. And so uh, we can relate the pattern of intensities to the chemical shielding anisotropy uh, by interpreting the spectrum with reference to our quantum chemical calculations. And the bottom line for our interpretation of this spectrum is that the chemical shielding of the nitrogen is extremely different along the triple bond axis of vis-a-vis the two perpendicular directions. Indeed, in the two perpendicular directions, we have 
uh, strong paramagnetic de-shielding of the system, whereas we have strong shielding of the system in the direction that is aligned with the molybdenum nitrogen triple bond. And I'm just mentioning this to show you that we have powerful methods to experimentally and theoretically characterize the bonding in a metal ligand multiple bond of this sort uh, and the opportunity afforded to us uh, in terms of the ability to incorporate that N15 isotope uh, was really uh, one of the nice consequences of having a system that actually splits N2 because N15 is an expensive isotope to be working with and one of the least expensive sources of it is actually N15 labeled N2 gas but uh, most metal nitrides aren't synthesized by splitting N2 gas. In our case, we're able to easily incorporate the N15 label and uh, do some exquisite experiments uh, like this work shown here that was done in collaboration with Professor Bob Griffin, a physical chemist at MIT. Uh, finally, I wanted to mention that although you'll be studying the thermal cleavage of the N2 molecule by allowing that bridging purple intermediate to to warm up in solution to room temperature whereupon the cleavage reaction spontaneously happens in an essentially quantitative thermal process, uh, this reaction we've also discovered uh, can be induced photochemically. And so and, and that is shown here. We have uh, a sample of the purple bridging N2 complex intermediate. You can see this dark color in the, in the picture shown here. Uh, this is held this was held at minus 78 degrees C right here in this uh, Schlenk tube. The solution is cold and it's being irradiated at 546 nanometers. So that's the wavelength of the, of the light coming out this way and it's being focused on the sample and you can actually see the, the purple color uh, bleaching to kind of a yellow gold color that is the color of the molybdenum nitride uh, complex formed when the N2 molecule is split. And so that's the color progression in this whole uh, thermal experiment too, that we have a red-brown three-coordinate molybdenum three complex that turns purple when it takes up N2, and then when it splits the N2, it turns to a yellow-gold sort of color. And uh, characterization of the purple intermediate and uh, includes characterization by UV visible spectroscopy and so what we're seeing here is that is the UV vis spectrum of the purple bridging N2 complex intermediate and um, this intermediate has this beautiful band right here at approximately 544 nanometers that you will be able to see if you take a UV visible spectrum of your purple intermediate, but that feature bleaches away if we irradiate the system using a mercury xenon arc lamp that you saw in the previous photograph. So that uh, UV vis feature is very diagnostic for formation of the bridging N2 complex intermediate. And then finally, I'd just like to wrap up by uh, pointing out that this Three coordinate molybdenum complex was the first of its kind, and there's, um, it's really a very unique thing. The coordination number three is most commonly encountered for 3D metals, and this is a very rare example of a 4D metal uh, having coordination number three. And that coordination number, as I've described, leads to a very interesting electronic structure with three unpaired electrons at the metal center. These are reducing. So the metal center is coordinatively unsaturated and it will bind various ligands including the N2 molecule um, and it will do a lot of different reactions in which it is able to transfer those electrons to, to a bound ligand ultimately resulting in a triple bond between some ligand atom and the molybdenum. Uh, we've shown this for a variety of different substances. The N2 molecule is the specific focus of this laboratory, but you're, if you're interested in learning more about the chemistry of this remarkable species, which is analogous to a reactive intermediate that's been stabilized by the use of sterically demanding ligands, uh, I'll be happy to point you to some more references where you can read about chemistry that has been seen with this molecule. 
And in the next uh, couple of videos, you'll learn more about how we do the organic chemistry for synthesizing the ligands and then use organometallic chemistry with organolithium reagents to deprotonate the ligand and then the coordination chemistry of actually preparing a molybdenum precursor and, and then putting these three bulky ligands onto the molybdenum center and synthesizing the complex so that it can be investigated for N2 cleavage chemistry. Okay, enjoy the laboratory.